<laughs> so we're going to look, we're going to gaze upon um, the Kenopansha. In the booklet here, we don't have the Sanskrit verses, we just have a translation. I think on page 8 it starts. The, the way these shastras, these scriptures work is you would traditionally learn it in Sanskrit and often you couldn't quite understand what it was saying and you just memorize it and then you kind of use it like a mantra and then after thousands of years you start to go, oh that's what they mean <laughs> but we read like a translation we go, oh that's sorry knew that you know, and blow it off and so, Well, so this first one is asking about, um, well, the second verse is asking about eyes. So these are the eyes of my eyes, these moon glasses. The mystery is no longer the eye of the eye. Very, 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 very. So, um, let, me, let me start just by saying, has anyone ever met a two-year-old? A two-year-old child, not yeah. a two-year-old adult. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they, you know, they're around. And it's usually around the age of two. Like, um, many of them, not all of them, go through this one period where they want to know why. Oh, yes, yeah, right. And uh, it's a very profound thing. You know, it's like Socrates is coming right through them. And you ask them to do something like, you know, why don't you pick that up? And they want to, and then they say, why? And, and I know with our son, and perhaps this was a mistake in retrospect, we would try to explain why. <laughs> and you give a good explanation, and uh, you know we want to pick it up so we keep the house clean, and so there are no germs that grow on the floor. And and then he he goes, hmm. and then he says, why? <laughs> and then you have to go down to the next layer of explanation, which is usually we have to talk about bacteria and germ theory and disease and immune system. <coughs> And this is with a two-year-old, and then you explain that as best, you know, to the extent of your scientific knowledge, and you go, hmm, why? And then you have to go into the psych psychology explanation, you know, because it makes us happy to be healthy, and, and then, why? Okay. And there's no end to the why. Eventually, a lot of parents, they just say, because I said so. Okay. I know they do. And then there's a block, and that's like the end of the spiritual... Yeah. <laughs> 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 Crippling in the mind of it. Oh, yeah. So, to this day, we're still trying to answer. Oh, that's the right answer. <laughs> Google it. You can right. check it out in the internet. <laughs> you can read and write. <laughs> And Patabi Joyce, uh, I don't know whether he, you know, you never knew what he was doing on purpose, but he would always go, why? He'd say, oh, Guruji, I'm very tired today. And he would say, why? <laughs> and then <laughs> he'd explain, well, it's because I ate too much for dinner, you know, and, you know, I'm jet lagged, and he would go, why? <laughs> Oh, because I couldn't eat earlier in the day, and you know, they, it's, it's like a 15,000 mile flight to get here. And I go, oh, why? And I go, well, because the earth. You know? <laughs> and, 
It was the same experience. <laughs> and he'd just be like laughing away. Wow, that's great. Ninety years old, that's awesome. Yeah, I <laughs> So this is the why Upanishad. And so some, the why Upanishad. The why. <laughs> Wonderful. And uh, so the first verse, it, it sounds like this. Neshitam tatapupreshitam manaha kingna prana pratama praiti yuktaha Neshita vachami mam vadanti chakshu shodram ka udevo yunakti So I'll read you two translations because the translations always always miss it for some reason. And so, by whom desired and set forth does the mind flow towards its, ooh, he says subject, but we're going to put object, okay. At whose bidding does again the chief prana proceed to its function? Oh, page eight in your book, yes. By whom wished do men utter speech? And what effulgent one indeed directs the eye or the ear? No, I don't, I don't like that translation. Um, so the one we have here, by whom impelled, by whom compelled, does the mind set forth to alight upon its objects? Linked together, by whom does prana proceed as the first function of perception? By whom is the language is this language will with which people speak? And who is the God that joins the sight and the hearing? Okay, so I was just asking these questions. And so this is considered like a the fundamental question. You know, here you are, and you're starting to like wake up and inquire, and what you're coming up against is the mystery of sense perception. Like, well, it's, it's just like when certain teenagers or something, you know, the first uh, you know, Friday night out or something. Like that. Wow, what is that? And they're looking. And they're utterly stunned by the, the, the just the immediacy of just sense perception. Uh, and it's, it's quite a mystery. I mean, it's, it's one of the great mysteries. Of, and instead, we, we ignore the, the mystery that's right in our face. And we go off, you know, just constructing our own biography, mm -hmm. you know, many kind of fantasies about what we are and what the world is. And, and yet we've had this absolutely uh, profound mystery right in, our, mm -hmm. right in our eyeball, right in your ear, in your nose or something, the pores of the skin. And so this is considered the fundamental mystery, you know, because when you see somebody dies, there, the eyeball is still there, but it's not looking. <laughs> the prana seems to be gone, the breath is gone. And so it appears as if mental functioning is gone. So it's like, what's going on here? And so then, of course, the, the answer comes. And this is the, this is both, over, I, in my opinion, the answer is overly simple, but it's also interesting the way it's presented. And so he says, it is the Ear, that which is the ear of the ear, the mind of the mind, the language behind the language, the eye of the eye. It is also the prana behind the prana. That's the answer. Okay. And so initially, you know, a typical Vedantist or uh, someone, can think, oh, you're just describing the soul. You know, the, 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 it's like, and and then it says. But the last part is, freed completely from these, the wise become immortal when they depart from this world. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, um, um, and so actually, here's my interpretation. Okay. So, because uh, a lot of these, uh, Old Upanishadic philosophers, you know, were very clever, and they dealt a lot with language theory in and of its 
so on. And so when you would say the I of the I, okay, what's implied, you know, to like the average person on the street is basically inside your eye. Um, you can't help but imagine there's a teeny little eye that's looking out of your eye. Do you ever have that imagination? Like there's a you know, teeny person looking out of the window or you're driving a giant yamcha. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and hearing through your ear. So what's this mystery of hearing? It's like, it's like, you know, what is it? What's going on? But the rational mind wants to know. So it answers it just by saying, oh, there's an ear in your ear. Which is like, oh, and for most people they go, oh, that explains it totally, no problem. <laughs> and there's a breath, you know, who's, who's, who's breathing? And so it's, it's the, the breath of the breath that's really breathing. Uh, and then the mystery of language, which is the whole function of mind, and, uh, is ancient. It's, it's believed that all thought and all experience, all creation is basically linguistic and structure, meaning it's information systems. It's not necessarily spoken language, but it's information where one thing stands for something else. And doing that, you can build hierarchies of knowledge, the information, and that's what creation is, is essentially language. So they say that the Bach, or language, is the creative principle, is the creative shakti that is the whole universe. Uh, similar to the idea of logos in uh, the West. So what is it, you know, what's the language that makes the language work? And so, someone who's played with this, what, what obviously has happened is someone has taken, oh, the eye of the eye is equally, and if you were a two-year-old, you would then ask the question, um, by whom impelled, by whom compelled, does the mind set forth the light of mind? So, link together, uh, okay. Um, and then you would say, that which is the so, what is it that um, sees through the eye of the eye? What is it that hears through the ear of the ear? And what breath is breathing the breath of the breath? And the mind, the language of the language, and it goes on and on and on. So you just take the same mystery to another level, and it's the same mystery. Okay, so my, the eye of my eye, now the ultimate explanation. I thought I'd arrive at, you know, the typical soul, but there's a little eternal eyeball that, you know, that reincarnates, keeps changing eyeballs. But then when I ask the question, who's looking out of the eye of the eye? And then the little two-year-old asks, well, who's looking out of the eye of the eye of the eye? And then you, being a responsible adult, you say, well, it's the eye. It's looking out of the eye. And you go, oh, okay. And same thing with the ear. It's the ear of the ear of the ear. Of the ear, of the ear. And so all, all this is trying to explain what we call consciousness, or just this awareness, which is like, uh, in and of itself, this absolute stunning mystery that you're currently experiencing. Uh, the, somehow the structure of mind doesn't want to experience that state of almost shocked unknowing, which is the immediate mystery of life. So it keeps this causal, it looks for cause, and it always like places its side again. And one of my favorite stories that some of you have heard before is the, the turtle story, which is part of the cover here. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and the famous question where the student asks the teacher, um, what is it that's holding up this whole universe? And because, you know, particularly if you study astronomy, uh, you often go through periods of total nausea and fear when you discover, one, we're all in a big round ball that's just spinning and nothing's holding it up. And it's flying at the really fast feet around the sun, which is another big round ball, which is also floating in the middle of no place, which is gradually orbiting 
uh, the very branches of the center of our galaxy, which is in the middle of no place, and that galaxy, and it's like, if you think about it, you turn your stomach. It's like, <laughs> I just want to like have some frame of reference that I can sit down on, you know, where is my <laughs> pelvic floor? <laughs> 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 And so the answer, the, the common answer in, in India is, well, don't worry. The entire universe is supported by a giant turtle. Okay. And this is before modern astronomy. So, and turtles are very trustworthy, nice creatures. If you've ever had a pet turtle, you know, they're not real fast, but they're really stable. And they're kind of grounded. So it's believed that the turtle is the support of the universe. Is the giant. And there are many different stories about, you know, it's one of the avatars of Vishnu is a giant tortoise who saves the earth mm -hmm. by diving in the ocean of destruction and pulling the earth back up. Um, and so then, of course, there's always someone, a two-year-old in the audience, and uh, they have to say, and this usually is after months and months of everyone being content with the turtle. Someone raises their hand and they say, Oh, Babaji, oh, Swamiji, what's holding up the turtle? <laughs> and there's a huge resistance uh, to not knowing uh, in the ego structure of mind. And so the, the, the teacher, the, the sage, uh, quickly says, Well, there's a Another turtle under that turtle, holding up the turtle. And, and then everybody goes, Because <laughs> you just can't imagine a turtle floating in the akash, you know, with nothing, no causality. Okay. And so then everyone is content except for the two year old. Who's holding up the turtle? It's holding up the turtle. It's holding up the turtle. And, and it, it's hard because you lose track of the numbers of turtles someday. But the questioning goes on and on and on as it does with a two-year-old. And a two-year-old is stubborn. You have you can be thousands of turtles down the causal chain. And still, if I go, well, what's holding up that turtle? And they go, well, there must be another turtle. Okay, there's another turtle under it. It drives you crazy. Okay. The, it's an infinite regress that happens, you know, when you're, you're looking for a, an absolute frame of reference causality, or an absolute self, you know, like, we say there's self in the Vedanta, mm -hmm. and, and of course in Buddhism is the basic thing is anatman, there is no self, and this is, but when we say self, what do we mean? And we start to look at it as something that's separate and solid and knowable, mm -hmm. and that is exactly what they don't mean. Um, not the self in any sense of the word self that we can come up with, like individual me sitting over here looking out. But uh, they merely mean, in a sense, just pure awareness or pure consciousness um, or pure joy or uh, pure openness, pure emptiness. And so what happens is you start to see in the process of inquiring, you know, by asking either who who am I? There's another, you know, Ramana Maharshi, they, yeah. that was his thing, you know, who are you? Um, coming up in the Kena Upanishad, in the third chapter, each of the gods rush up to this mysterious little yaksha that appears, and the yaksha, who is small and cute, is just amazing. The yaksha asks them, as they, they, they rush up and they look like cops, you know, because they're gods, they probably have multiple arms and, you know, fantastic crowns and maybe fancy weapons and, you know, they're very impressive. And they rush up to you saying, who are you? But as they rushed up to this unknown little creature, the little creature says to them, who are you? And they say, just like Ramana Maharshi would, who are you? And he said, well, I'm a Richard, you know, I live in Colorado. <laughs> and then they just look at it and they go, no, who are you? And you have to, each time you have to take what you thought was you and you trash that definition 
and then you come up with another one, and then the question comes again, who are you? And you have to trench that definition. And pretty soon you get just stacks and stacks of useless definitions. Anything you come up with is why, who? Um, and so what you what is sensed then is this um, infinite regress of how mind works, looking for self or looking for what's, you know, you're looking for either the self or some particular thing, you know, some kind of absolute framework to truly know it. If you really know it, then the constructed you, your ego, is happy and secure and maybe even immortal if you can find it. And, but you, the bottom is falling out constantly. And so you get this, it's almost in the pit of your stomach, it's a visceral sense that whoops, uh, I'm falling into a black hole, or you know, maybe that's not even the right phrase. It's like infinite regress, you know. I don't know if there should be red flags. I think there should be maybe green flags for good news. This is fantastic news. You get another infinite regress. And this is what the wise knowing this, and the actual term is they let go completely. So when they, you start to feel, oh, you're holding a situation, and you start to see the situation as actually having no absolute separateness to it, mm -hmm. same as the word shunyata, it's emptiness. The, it's not like a decision, the letting go is just like, you, and the wise, the dira, the sober, letting go, uh, become immortal, or they're free of death, basically. And so that's what's pointed out 